Well, good morning and happy Easter to you. Welcome to this early Easter service, and we're so thankful that you're here today. And I've been waiting to do this all week long. Ready? I'm going to say, He is risen, and you're going to say, He is risen indeed. All right, ready? We got this from the Bible, Luke 24, 34. The Bible says that they said, He is risen indeed, just as He says. Are you ready? He is risen. Hey, that wasn't bad for 9 a.m. on an Easter Sunday morning. Thanks for being here. We're really excited about today, and we're looking forward to what the Lord has. We're going to spend some time this morning. We've got some special music, and then we'll hear a Bible message. Uh, we're going to end our time with just an opportunity for everybody to respond to God's Word today. We do that every Sunday, not just on Easter. And, uh, and of course, uh, we'd like to just say welcome to many of you who are guests. We hope you've been uh, encouraged already. Hopefully, you picked up, uh, stopped by the tent and picked up the welcome gift. If you didn't, you can do that on your way out as well here by the door. And, uh, and then we have a photo a spot over here. I want to remind you of that before you leave. So uh, get your family and uh, stop by there and uh, take a picture together. And I really believe that God's going to use this message in, uh, in this service in all of our hearts in a very special way. So I'd like to ask you to just uh, pray with me, if you would, here as we begin. And uh, let, before I pray, let me read this scripture. This is Matthew 28. Verses 1 through 6, and it says, In the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulcher. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. His countenance was like lightning and his raiment white as snow. And for fear of him, the keepers did shake and became as dead men. And the angel answered and said unto the women, Fear not, for I know that ye seek Jesus, which was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen, as he said. Come see the place where the Lord lay. And for all of us, uh, today is not just uh, the only time we celebrate uh, resurrection. Uh, we celebrate that really every single Sunday. We really believe that it is our hope. And it is the reason why we can uh, look at our lives and have hope. We have forgiveness of sin. And if you're here today and you're visiting with us, we just want you to know something. This Jesus, he's alive and he loves you. And he wants to have a personal relationship with you. And we hope today is, uh, is the start of that if you don't have one. Let's pray together. Lord, we're so grateful for the resurrection. We praise you today because of what you did there 2,000 years ago. How you de defeated sin and defeated sorrow and death. And Lord, today we can stand in hope of, uh, Lord, the fact that uh, you uh, are alive and that you live within us. And Lord, because of that, we know that death has no sting and that you are the victor. Thank you, Lord, for not only dying for our sins, but then being buried and then rising on the third day. And today, Lord, we praise you. We uh, acknowledge the fact that you live within us and that today we have the victory because of it. And I pray today, if anybody's here that doesn't know you, today would be that day where they would seal their salvation. And today, Lord, they would receive you as their gift, their salvation for all of eternity. And Lord, we'll give you the praise and honor for all you do today in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. was his cry, the perfect lamb was crucified. 
wonderful. Nothing like the kids to help us get in the spirit of resurrection. Stand together. Let's all sing now. The song is very simply, Christ Arose. It's a wonderful Shines like a 
singing well this morning. That's a great song. We sing for all he's done for us. I'm so glad you're here. I just want to stop in, the, in, in this service and say welcome to our first time guests. If this is your first time here or your first time in a while, we just want to say thank you for being here with us uh, and worshiping the Lord with us today. It's a joy to have you and uh, we are so glad you came. I hope that on your way in you received a, you stopped by the welcome tent and received a bag, a welcome bag, a gift. Uh, we have one there for all different ages. There's one for adults, there's one for uh, uh, teenagers, student ministry age, and then there's one for the elementary age kids. And that's because we have something going on for the entire family here at Greater Rhode Island. So I hope that you'll take that. There's a book inside. I hope you'll read it. And uh, we hope today that you're encouraged. You can connect with us. You can get to know a lot about our church through via our website, our social media channels. And uh, we would love for you to do that. And we'd love to connect with you. And uh, today we simply ask that you just fill out a connection card. That's what we call it. At some point during the service, if you'll take your phone and aim it at that QR code in the chair in front of you and just click on the connection card link, fill that out electronically. We'd love to get to know you. Or you can fill one of these out, a paper one, if you haven't done that already here today. And so we're just really glad you're here. We're going to stop and say thanks. So would you do this for me, church family? Help me welcome our first time guest here at Greater Rhode Island this Easter Sunday morning. Let's keep singing about what the Lord's done today. He's worthy, worthy of our praise, and we praise him for all that he's done for us. Let's sing. Praise God. 
you be seated as we hear another choir song. You have 
Great job. Thanks, uh, choir. I'm going to let them come down. What a blessing it is to know. Jesus has overcome the world. There's nothing in our way, the Bible says. We have the victory when we have Jesus Christ, and I pray that today you have that assurance. What a wonderful thing is to know the Savior, and I'm glad that you're here today. We're going to pray here now and uh, just in our worship time as uh, we end with giving, and uh, it's a wonderful privilege for those of us who are Christians and uh, members here at Greater Rhode Island to give. If you're visiting with us, I hope you don't feel obligated. This is not for you. If you want to help us in our mission to get the gospel of Jesus Christ, we think it's the greatest message in all the world, but uh, and uh, you're welcome to give, but don't feel obligated. The only thing we ask of you is that you enjoy the service, that you receive the gifts that we have for you, and uh, hopefully that you come back. We truly pray that you will consider doing that and uh, worship with us all the time. We have a lot going on here at Greater Rhode Island. Our uh, services are just the tip of the iceberg, really. On Sunday nights, on, on a, a regular weekend, we have at 6 p.m. Bible studies for all the ages. That's adult and uh, students and uh, kids all the way down to nursery. So uh, there's uh, for something for everybody at 6 o'clock normally on Sundays. We don't have that today because it's uh, uh, Easter weekend. But uh, next week, we hope you'll come back and then join one of these Bible study groups. They are where the really the action happens. It's what helps our church feel small all year round. Uh, we have Bible study there, connection, fellowship. How many you think believers ought to study the Bible and uh, and get to know one another? How many think that's a good idea, right? So, so we do that every single week. And I'm telling you that's, it's a wonderful program. We have a WANA for the kids, we call it. That's a Bible club at the same time. So parents, you don't have to worry about what to do with them. And then we have a student ministry Bible study for uh, those in high school. And so it's just a, it's just a great time. Uh, I want us to just pray then for the offerings. There's three ways to give here at Greater Rhode Island. You can give at the, at the giving boxes by each door. And uh, if you want to do that tangibly, and uh, you can also... Uh, give uh, online. We use what we call the Church Center app. That's the way to get to know all things Greater Rhode Island Baptist. And then you can also do that on our website. It's simple. It's secure. It's just like paying your electric bill. You go on there. You set up a profile one time. And from then on, it's just a done deal. So some of you have taken advantage of that. And I'm glad you have. I, I want to ask you if you would to stand with me this morning. And I'm going to ask Brother Steve Uzera to come up. Where are you? Brother Steve, come on up here. And I'm going to have him pray for our offering today. And ask the Lord to help us. Uh, today as we uh, give uh, to honor him and that he would meet the needs here and then after he's done praying we'll get into God's word let's pray our gracious heavenly father we uh, we bow our our hearts to you this morning we thank you so much that you are a living God that you are a risen savior we thank you for your love your unfailing love we thank you for your abundant grace lord and father now it um desire to give back to you a portion of what you have blessed us with, Lord, and uh, we recognize that that which we give back to you is that which you had already given to us, and so we ask that you would just bless the hearts of your people as they give, that it would be done cheerfully and with a, with a, a giving heart, Lord, for it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Take your Bible, if you would, and take your seat and go to Romans chapter 10, and uh, you may share with somebody maybe next to you if they need that and uh, today uh, we're in the book of Romans which is called sometimes the constitution of Christianity it's uh, really where the basics of being a Christian is is found and uh, I wonder if you have someone you love uh, perhaps uh, your children or your parents grandkids I wonder what you desire for them what your greatest desire for their life is uh, some of you may say oh pastor you know I just I would love for them to get a good education that's what I want and we've got to be careful what we wish for, you know. If all we get want is education, they may just become a clever sinner. You know what I'm saying? Uh, you say, oh, I want them to be cultured. I want them to uh, be people who make the world a better place and be good citizens in this world. And i got to tell you something. Uh, if all we get for them is, is culture, uh, all we're doing is making this world a better place to go to hell from. Uh, some people say, oh, I want my kids just to be financially well off. I want them to just not lack anything. My goal is that they would have everything materially that they could ever desire. And the truth is, uh, uh, what difference does that make if they rise up in judgment day and they come face to face to a God they've never known? So when we consider man's greatest need, the Bible says that man's greatest need is salvation. It's salvation. It's to have our sins forgiven. It's to know God personally. Now, if we had needed, for example, uh, education, Jesus would have come as a teacher. Now, he taught, but that's not why he came. 
Uh, if we had needed uh, money, if that was man's greatest need, Jesus would have come as a financier. God would have sent his son as a, as a maybe as an economist, but that's not what he came for. If the greatest need for man was culture, Jesus would have come as a social worker to help people, you know, uh, live life and so on. But that's not why Jesus came. You know, Jesus Christ came to this earth 2,000 years ago as a savior. Luke 19, 20, 10 says, it's for the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. That's why he came. When the angel announced his birth that first Christmas, he said to those uh, shepherds, he says, hey, you're going to call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. See, that's the whole reason Jesus Christ came. So I want to ask you this question. Are you saved? Do you have salvation? You say, well, you know, Pastor Carlos, thanks for the question, but nobody can really know that. Nobody can know if they're going to heaven. Can I tell you something? The Bible says you can. You know, in 1 John 5, in verse number 12, the Bible says, he that hath the Son hath life. And then it says this, he that hath not the Son hath not life. Notice it there. It's one of the two. And then it says in verse 13, these things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may, watch the word there, that ye may hope. Is that what it said? That's not what it said, is it? That ye may wish. <laughs> That's not what it says, is it? The Bible says that the Bible was written. These things were written, it says, to you so that you may K-N-O-W know. I want to talk to you today about salvation. And it's not a hope so salvation. It's not a trying so salvation. The Bible says you can know and you can know that through the word of God. Do you realize that God has made this question of are you saved very simple to answer? And so today I want to talk to you about the simplicity of salvation because God wants you to be saved. God wants you to know it today. And if you don't know that, he wants you to walk out of here with a assurance. And so he said he came to save. Now, salvation deals with every problem of mankind. The gospel, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ deals with every problem mankind has. You say, well, what are mankind's problems? There are just three, not two, not four, just three. Think about this. <laughs> three. Okay. I'm like the kids anymore, right? Three problems. There's sin, sorrow, and death. Now, I've dared people many times and said, hey, you think of another problem that doesn't fall under those three, and then they can't think of any. Sin, sorrow, and death. That's it. And Jesus Christ came to have victory over sin, sorrow, and death. Now, in the book of Romans, here's Paul writing, inspired by the Holy Spirit in verse number one. And he says, brethren, he says, he's talking here to uh, God's people. And he says, my heart's desire in prayer to God for Israel is that they might be, say it, Save. Now, a lot of people push back on that word saved anymore. They don't want to talk about being saved. But that's what Paul said. He said when he thought of his friends and his family, the people that he loved, he said that his greatest desire for them was that they would be saved. He said they were like a lot of people. They had a zeal for God. They were religious. Maybe they were even spiritual. And you may be here and you may be spiritual and you may be religious, but the Bible says there's a difference between being religious and spiritual and being saved. He said that he had a lot of people he loved who the Bible says had religion and spirituality, but they didn't have salvation. They were lost. And he said his greatest desire for them was that they would know, the Bible says, how they could be saved. Now, I want you to see in this passage, we're just going to go right down these first 13 verses, and, uh, and then we'll head out, get a good picture, and have a nice meal. What do you all think? Notice in verse number two, I want you to see the righteousness that is needed. The Bible says that this thing of salvation starts with a righteousness. Verse two says, for I bear them record. In other words, I can give testimony that they have a zeal of God. In other words, they have a zealous, they have a desire for the things of God, but not according to knowledge. Here God is talking about righteousness. We'll see in a minute in verse number three. And he says, um, they are, they have be, being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. You know what that says there? It says very simply this, that they, the Bible says they, speaking of humankind, mankind, he says, we tend to have, the Bible says, ideas about God and about righteousness and salvation. He says, but here's the problem. We're often ignorant about what God really says about the topic. 
It says, they, he says, they have zeal, but they don't have knowledge. They're trying to establish their own. In other words, hey, what I think this, well, I just believe that. How many of you all understand this morning? Salvation is of God. It doesn't really matter what you think. So today we're here to just, just try to get God's righteousness. See, what's the source of salvation? Salvation is very simply, the Bible says, it is uh, something that comes from the grace of God, not from the goodness of man. It's something that we get because of God's mercy, not because of our merit. It's a gift to be received, not something that we earn. So that poses a problem. He says the problem is that they, mankind, is ignorant of God's righteousness. Now, how many of you would agree? Most of us, humanity, oftentimes gets this thing of salvation all wrong. I mean, we just get spiritual things all twisted up. You know what I mean? And there's so many ways we can illustrate that. For example, do you know what the Bible says, for example? The Bible says, believe and be baptized. You know what we do? We baptize kids and hope they grow up someday and believe in God. How many of you figured that out, right? You know, the Bible never baptizes an infant. Never in the Bible. And never in the Bible is baptism something that happens before somebody believes. Uh, it was always a symbol of somebody believing in the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so the Bible says we leave and be baptized. For example, the Bible says, seek first the kingdom of God and all these things will be added unto you. Now, you know what most men do, most of us do, mankind? We put things first and God second. And then we wonder why, oh, why has God forsaken me? How many of you understand? God says, no, I've got to be first. And then I'll get involved in your material things. I'll, you take care of my business, so quote unquote, I'll take care of your business. You know, the Bible says, for example, come, uh, if you're going to come to the Lord, it says you need to have faith like faith of a child. You know what we do? A little kid comes forward to get saved and we ask him adult questions. We act like, do you really understand? I mean, are you, do you know what you're doing? Do you know what the Bible says? Really, we ought to have kids up here at the invitation time asking some of the adults, do you really understand? <laughs> do you really have faith? The Bible says you're supposed to believe like kids. <laughs> not, we're not trying to get kids to believe like adults. That's, that's backwards. So when it comes to salvation, especially to the righteousness, the Bible says, we need to understand. We, we oftentimes think, well, we need to be good and accepted by God, and then we'll have righteousness. And the Bible says that's totally backwards. See, verse 4 says, for Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that, say it, believeth. Believe it. Notice that. The Bible says, in other words, stop trying to keep the law and thinking that by being good, you're going to get saved. Knock it off. It's not by trying to be good, it's by trusting in the Savior, Jesus Christ. There's no better example of this than the man who was writing this, the Apostle Paul. Paul was a man who gave his testimony later in the book of Philippians, chapter number 3. Notice what he said there. I want you to think about his example. He said, though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that he had whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more. In other words, he says, listen, if somebody's got something to brag about, he says, I've got, I could brag. Verse 5, he goes on to say, circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as touching the law, a Pharisee. In other words, Paul said, listen, I was of a good pedigree. I mean, I had a good upbringing, a good family, a good education. And in fact, I, he had good practice. Nobody could point to Paul and go, he, see, he didn't honor his mother. He didn't keep the Sabbath. He didn't, he didn't, he was a lie. He was a cheat. The Bible says he, nobody could do that. He, he wasn't a blasphemer. He wasn't, the Bible says, a, a, a Sabbath breaker. But notice what he says in verse 7. This is amazing. But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. Notice what else he says. He says, but by the way, he says, all these things over here that I had on the positive side of the ledger, he says, I actually considered them negative when it came to my relationship with God. He goes, I look back on it now, and he goes, I think those were liabilities, not assets. Those were negatives. And you say, how could something good like education and, and good, good works and so on be considered negative in someone's mind when it comes to having a relationship with God? Well, I tell you very, very simply, because Paul said, those are the things that kept me from trusting in Jesus Christ for salvation. And listen, the Bible says uh, that all of a sudden, he said, those things I counted as loss. He says, they were bad to me. Somebody may say, Pastor, now you've, you've fallen off your rocker. Are you trying to tell us today that good works are actually bad when it comes to a relationship with God? <laughs> uh, how can they be bad? Listen, how can a highway be bad? Well, listen, it's bad if you jump on and you start going the wrong way. If you're going north and grandma's house is south, listen, that's not good. 
And it's the same ways. Good works aren't bad except if you're trusting in them. And human goodness becomes some of the worst human badness when human goodness is what you consider is going to save you instead of the fact that Jesus Christ and his sacrifice on the cross for your sins is the only thing that can save you. So when God looks at our goodness, the Bible says, Isaiah 64 says it this way. It says, all of our righteousnesses as, our, as, as filthy rags in God's sight. That word righteousness is, is the idea of our good things. He says God sees them as filthy rags, as a, as a rag that you've maybe a bandit, bandaged up a cut or something that, that's, that's it's filthy. And he says, I see it as something putrid, something repulsive. Why? Because if you are thinking here, you know what, the, I am a good person. If that's what you're sitting here thinking is going to save you, God says, I see that as filthy because it's what you're trusting in instead of trusting in my son. Friend, friend listen, it's, this is very simple. Of the eight and a half billion people on the planet, if you were to uh, somehow we'd be able to squeeze out all of the good and put it in a vial and you were to put it, maybe uh, all of the good of eight and a half billion people, if all the good works and put them in one person, that one person would still desperately need to be saved by the mercy of God. Because all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The Bible says. And so listen to what the Bible says about salvation. It says in Romans 6, 23, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. You know what that means? Listen, it means salvation is a gift. It's not a wage that you earn. Titus 3 says, Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to His mercy He saved us, by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. So do you see it there? The Bible says it's something that's a mercy. It's God, something God gives. Ephesians 2 says, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's the gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast, it says. In other words, it's very clear. Nobody can stand up here and say, I'm going to heaven because I've kept all the law. I'm going to heaven because I've been good enough. Do you realize the Bible says it's not by works which we do. It's by, listen, what he did. And so that's the difference between the law, or maybe you use the word religion, and salvation. We use the, the word in the Bible is the gospel, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. See, religion says do this and live. The gospel says live and then you will do. Religion says pay me what you owe, but the gospel says I fully forgive all. Religion say, demands holiness, but the gospel provides holiness. Religion says do, the gospel says done. Religion says, uh, you, you, if you, you know, blessing results from obedience. Whereas the gospel says obedience results from the blessing, salvation. Uh, religion places the day of rest on the seventh day at the end of the work week. The gospel places the day of rest at the beginning of the work week, before we work. Uh, religion is, is uh, if salvation says therefore. Religion is salvation uh, is wages. Rel re salvation, uh, the gospel says salvation is a gift. Religion says run <laughs> and gives you no legs. The gospel says fly and it gives you wings of grace. Let me tell you something. Christ is the end of the law for righteousness, it says there. In other words, friend, quit trying to earn your salvation. Salvation is not a goal to be achieved. It's a gift to be received. You simply receive it. You say, how do we receive it? In verse 4, it says it clearly. It says, to everyone that believeth. Believe it. Do you see it there? To everyone that believe it. That's all you've got to do. The Bible says you've got to believe. Not to the one who tries, but to the one who trusts. It doesn't come to the person who's trying, the person who's trusting. He's a missionary to the South Sea Islands, and uh, he told this story one time. He went to this island, and they had no word of God. They had no Bible. And so he developed, uh, of course, he uh, uh, translated the, the scriptures into, into their language, the New Testament. And uh, he was having trouble with this word believe, though, this word believe. And so he would ask them, he would say, listen, how do you say when you, when you it's more than head knowledge, believe, because for a lot of us, believe is like, you know, you believe uh, Tom Brady won the Super Bowls, just like you believe in Jesus. And he's like, no, no, it's got to be more than that. It's like when you just are totally trusting in that. And they would look at him and they go, I don't know what you mean. We don't know what you're asking. And he kept asking, what's your word for faith when you, when you totally abandon and totally uh, uh, rest on something? And they, they, couldn't, they couldn't answer. 
So he kept searching. Well, one day, one of the natives came, and he was kind of picking up with their, in their primitive mail system there some mail. And one of the natives had literally ran across the island to deliver some mail. And uh, this man, you know, walked in, and he dropped off the mail. And he went over, and there was this big chair. And this guy, I mean, big old guy, he just went, and he just unloaded himself and just dropped in that chair. And he looked at him, and the missionary said, what did you just do? He said, I just sat, and he said the word, he said, I just sat down. And he said, no, what's the word? What do you call it when you do that? He said, when you just throw yourself in all of your weight, and you're totally depending on something. And he said, he said, oh, and he gave him the word, and that's the word he used to plug into the Bible, that word believe. See, it's not head knowledge, friend trusting, believing in the Bible. Faith is the Bible says when all of a sudden you put yourself completely. See, that's what the Bible says in John 3. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. The source of salvation is not the goodness of man. It's the grace of God. It's a gift for the person who quits trying and all of a sudden, watch this, trusts in Jesus Christ. The Bible says, notice we saw a, uh, simply what we call, uh, we call the righteousness that is needed. You have to have the righteousness of God. Notice number two in verse number six, the resource that is near. Here's a resource that's near to everybody. Salvation, verse six, but the righteousness which is of faith speaketh, speaketh on this wise. In other words, in this way, say not in thine heart, who shall ascend into heaven? That is to bring Christ down from Above. Now, this is interesting. The Bible says that salvation is so simple. It says there that it's, it's, it's close. Notice in verse 7, Or who shall descend into the deep, that is to bring up Christ again from the dead? But what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thine heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. It says it's near. Notice how close you are to having salvation, the Bible says. It's very simple. The Bible says in verse 6, we don't need to, it says verse 6, it says you don't have to uh, ascend, it says, into heaven to bring Christ down from above. In other words, some people think, well, listen, uh, listen, pastor, here's the way it goes. One day you get to heaven and there's, you know, uh, Simon or Peter, or whatever you want to call him, and he's at the gate. And he's going to outweigh the good and the bad. And if you're good outweighs the bad, that's how you get in. And somehow they think, if I could go up to heaven, maybe up there, God could tell me if I'm saved or not. Listen, the Bible says, no, you don't. He came down to tell you. You don't have to think that way anymore. Notice in verse 7, it says there, he asked this, it, notice that he poses another scenario. He says, don't look at it like this. Or who shall descend into the deep, that is to bring up Christ again from the dead. In other words, some people think of it as, well, if only someone would go down to the grave, to death and hell, and, um, and, and free Jesus and bring him up from the dead. Listen to me. God already did that. He rose again on the third day. We celebrate today an empty tomb. The grave opened. The earth, the earth quaked. The veil was raised into in the temple. This wasn't something done in secret. It was very evident that God raised him already from the dead. Notice verse 8 then. It says this. But what saith it? In other words, what is salvation? It says, the word is near to you, even in thy mouth and in thine heart. Listen, friend, this is amazing. Do you know how close salvation is to you right now? It's in your heart. It's in your mouth. That doesn't mean you're saved. You say, well, I don't think I'm saved, but you're telling me it's in my heart and my mouth. How, how did it get in there? Listen, you know how I got in there? I preached it to you. Verse 8 says it very simply. That is the word of faith which we preach. In other words, I just told you how to get saved. I told you, you've got to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Bible says it's really simple. It's not out there, salvation, up there in heaven. It's not down there on earth, and it's not out there somewhere in the cosmos. Listen, the Bible says it's near you. It's in your heart. You have, the Bible says, in you right now, uh, the, the Bible says resource very near. You say, how did it get there? I preached it to you. You say, well, what am I supposed to do with it? Notice verse 9. It tells you that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shall believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. You know what you need to do? Very simply, the Bible says this. Watch this. If you will do this, if you'll confess with your mouth and believe in your heart, the Bible says you can be saved today. Notice, I want you to see the requirement that is necessary. This is very simple. The very first requirement, God says, if you will believe on Jesus Christ, he says he wants you to confess it. Confess it. You say, what is that? <laughs> it's you have to believe it. How? You believe with your heart. But watch this. You've got to go further. It says you've got to confess it. You say, how do we confess? With your mouth. Now, the word of God 
is there. I preached it to you. You have in your heart right now. You've heard that all you've got to do is believe in Jesus Christ. And the Bible says that all of a sudden, if you believe, watch this, and you say, well, pastor, that's very private. I feel like that's just between me and God. That's true. Believing, trusting in God, that's between you and the Lord. Listen, but confession, that's public. And God says, I want you to go public with the thing. Listen, God says, I want you to use your mouth and agree. Confess means to agree with God, to say what God says. When a man believes in his heart, you know what he's willing to do? He's willing to confess. When he believes that Jesus Christ uh, suffered on a cruel cross, a cruel death, and was buried on the third day, and that he rose again for his sins and for his salvation. You know what the Bible says? That's, that's uh, all of a sudden something a man is willing to confess. And you say, well, what does God want me to do? He wants you to make public that decision that you, you have in your heart. See, Jesus said it this way in Mark 8, 38. Whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he cometh in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Matthew 8, 10, 32, Jesus said, Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I confess also before my Father which is in heaven. See, God says that private, that private decision in your heart to believe and accept salvation needs to be willing to make, the Bible says publicly, uh, a prayer that it, and all of a sudden when you're willing to pray and say that it is real, the Bible says you need to confess it. Notice what else it says. It talks about the commitment of it. Notice in verse 9, he says, That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth... It says this way, the Lord Jesus. <laughs> that implies a commitment. You say, well, what do you mean a commitment, Pastor? That all of a sudden you're, you're confessing that Jesus Christ is Lord. Now, that may not mean much to you. In our time, it doesn't mean anything. You know, we could, uh, if a guy, you know, uh, uh, makes three goals and uh, wins the gold medal for his team, they, they, uh, he can go back to his country and they make him a Lord. You know, Lord Carlos, Lord Charles, Lord Dylan, Lord, you know, Lord Joe, whatever. It means nothing to us. But, you know, when the word Lord was used in this day, it meant something. See, it means he was above all. Now, Nobody minds talking about Jesus today as long as it's just your religion and it's the same as every other religion. I'm just here to tell you, friend, when you receive Jesus Christ as Lord, what you're acknowledging is that he is the way, the truth, and the life. That no man can come to the Father but by him because that's what he said. See, God sent his son and he said, this is the way. Today, people don't care what you believe so as long as it's all equal. You know what I mean? If we all coexist, if it's all syncretism, you know what I mean? Uh, you know, good, good devil, bad God, you know, all kind of the same, all level out. It doesn't really matter. And, but listen, the Bible is, puts it another way. The first century believers, when they called him the Lord Jesus Christ, they knew they knew something. See, if a Roman soldier caught a Christian and he would stop him and he would say, you need to declare Kaiser, Caesar, Kudios, that Caesar is Lord. He is above all. He was literally deity in their mind. And a Christian would look at a Roman soldier and he would say, no, no, Christos, Kudios. He would say, Jesus Christ is Lord. And when he said that, he understood very well what he was doing. See, that meant he was getting taken to the dungeon or to the rack, or fed to the lions. This wasn't just a religion. This was a very real relationship. He was, he was making a commitment. He was saying, he is above all others. Friend, that's what a Christian is. It's somebody who understands he's Lord of all, and he's Lord of my life. It's a confession. It's a commitment. Notice number three, it's a confidence and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, it says in verse 9. Why do I confess, you say? Because he's Lord. <laughs> How do I know he's Lord? Listen to me. Because he was raised from the dead. This one miracle, the Bible says, is the miracle that sets Jesus apart and gives him, the Bible says, the right to be called Lord. Romans 1, 4 says, and he, and he was declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. What a miracle. You say, well, what about the virgin birth? Well, listen, if you believe that he died, you believe that he was virgin born. And if you believe the resurrection, you believe that he died. If you believe the resurrection, you believe all of it. You believe the entire gospel. The Bible says that if you believe, if you confess that he was raised from the dead, the Bible says you have confidence in the person of Jesus Christ. Somebody said it well. If Jesus Christ is still in the grave, nothing really matters. 
But if Jesus Christ came out of that grave, nothing but that really matters. Amen. See, we have confidence. Notice number four, we have courage. Verse 10 says it this way. Notice what it says about those that are saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, listen to what the Bible says, Whoever, whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. What confidence comes to your life when all of a sudden you are saved? When you have salvation, listen, I remember I gave my life to Jesus Christ when I was eight years old. I'd gone to church. I had religion. But you know what? I wasn't saved. I wasn't sure that my sins were forgiven. And really, I didn't understand it. But I can tell you this. The minute that I trusted in Jesus Christ and I received him as my savior and my king, I can tell you something. My life changed. My family's life changed. I'm telling you, our entire family, when we came to Jesus Christ, we found rest for our souls, victory for our lives, and we continue to find that today. And I thank the Lord. I don't know where I'd be without the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm not here. I'm telling you, I'm not ashamed to tell you he is my savior. He's my Lord. Amen. Listen to me. Anybody the Bible says who receives Jesus Christ will not be ashamed. They'll not be ashamed of it. They don't have a problem telling you Jesus Christ is everything. Paul said, God, who is our life. Notice lastly, the consequence of it. Verse 12, he says, this is awesome. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. You know what it says there? It says very simply this, that it makes no difference whether you're Italian or Irish or African or black or Latino or, uh, you know, you're just a good old mutt you know, American. Amen. It doesn't really matter who you are or who you think you are. It doesn't matter if you're Jew or Greek, poor or rich. It doesn't matter what neighborhood you live in or where you come from. The Bible says it very clear. He's able to give salvation, grace, power to anyone. The Bible says there in verse number 12 that he's able to make us rich unto all that call upon him. He's rich. In other words, the resources of life, the real riches. I'm talking about wisdom and righteousness and power and, and victory all of a sudden comes into the life of a Christian. And it's an amazing thing. Getting saved is not switching religions, friend. It, it's trusting in Jesus. You don't get saved and then say, well, I'll try to live like a Baptist now. That's not the goal. Listen, it's all of a sudden living in the power of Jesus Christ who all of a sudden comes to live in you. See, because you receive in that moment the forgiveness of your sin. But not just heaven one day when you die. You also receive his presence every single day in your heart. You receive, the Bible says, your pardon and you're perfected. You receive a new heart. You become a new creature. You receive the power of Jesus Christ comes to live in you. And the promise that you'll spend eternity of, with God along with all of the redeemed of the ages. Amen. Notice verse 13. It says, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I want you to read that with me. Can you do that? One, two, three. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. saved. Whosoever. Say, Whoso, whosoever. Listen, raise your hand. Everybody raise your hand. Can you do that for me? Okay, just raise your hand, all right? You guys are all whosoevers. That's it. That's anybody. Doesn't matter who you are. Well, you say, well, I'm just, I'm just really, you know, I'm just not a religious person. You're a whosoever. You can get saved today. Oh, well, you know, I just, I'm, I'm just not one of those spiritual people. No, no, no. You're a whosoever. You can get saved. Well, I'm not sure I'm one of the elect. Some people, you know, like to think that way. Listen, you're a whosoever. You can get saved. Oh, well, you know, I'm just, I'm just, uh, I'm a sinner. You don't know how bad I am. Now, listen, you're a whosoever. You could be saved today. You say, well, I'm, uh, you know, I'm just a really good person. And, you know, that's the thing. I don't really need to be saved. No, no, you're a whosoever. You need to be saved. Amen. Whosoever, watch this, shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Amen. Now, I love this time of year. Something happens. Spring comes around. And it means for me the start of baseball season. And the Yankees just took three games from the Astros down in Houston. Amen. Hallelujah. Glory to God. I don't know what the Red Sox did. Whatever. Now, you know, in baseball, you get three strikes. Guy's up there, and I mean, he's trying to hit that ball. He gets three chances. And you know, with this thing of salvation, I was thinking about it. You get three strikes, too. Now, here's your first strike. Ready? First strike is you die before the age of accountability. In other words, if you were to die before you understand this, the Bible says babies, those, those little ones, they go to heaven directly. Do you understand that? Okay. If you understand that, you're past the age of accountability, okay? So that's one strike on you. Watch this. 
The second strike is, the Bible says, the second option is live a perfect life. Stand up and tell everybody in this room today, I've never sinned, I've never lied, I've never cheated, I've never done anything wrong, never had a bad thought. So we're all 0-2. Third strike, watch this. So in your only opportunity in this life then is very simply this. To believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. It's amazing to me what people will say, their own righteousness. Every one of us, the Bible says, we're ignorant. We're trying to establish our own. God's righteousness, listen, is necessary. You have, to the Bible says, received righteousness, which is through Jesus Christ. See, the question today is, are you saved? Friend, it's really simple. Whosoever will call today on the Lord Jesus Christ shall be saved. Would you stand with me this morning with your head bowed and eyes closed? And this is our invitation moment. We respond to the Lord, to his word. How many of you here, you'd say it this way. You know, Pastor Carlos, I'm absolutely certain if I were to die today, I'd spend eternity in heaven. I know, and it's not because of my righteousness. It's because of what Jesus did he died, was buried, and rose again on the third day. And one day I believed in what he did for me and what he did. Not what I did. I put my faith in that. And according to the Bible, God says I'm saved. And I put my faith in that. How many of you here you say, that's me. I am saved. I know it. Raise your hand up high. Amen. Isn't that great? That's a great majority of us. You can put your hand down. Now, that's not all of us. And I want to talk to you. If you're here and you're saved, would you pray for everyone else that needs to make this decision? Friend, if you're not absolutely certain if you died right now, you'd go to heaven. Would you call in the name of the Lord? If you believe in your heart what Jesus did, are you willing to confess it right now? I want you to repeat a prayer with me there in your seat. If you're here and you'd say, I'd love to know. I want to be saved. God, say it right now with me. Repeat. God, I know that you desire to save me. Tell him, say, Jesus, you died to save me. You've been raised from the dead. I trust you right now to save me. Save me, Jesus. Be my Lord and Savior. Tell him, thank you for saving me. Make me the Christian now that you want me to be. Tell him that. Save me, Jesus. Now, how many of you today would just say, Pastor Carlos, I just confessed. I just prayed that simple prayer. Now, my prayer doesn't save you. If you believe in your heart, you confess it with your mouth. The Bible says, God, Jesus Christ, saves you. How many of you would say this morning, Pastor Carlos, I just prayed that prayer. Would you raise your hand up high this morning? I just did that. God bless you. God bless you, ma'am. God bless you, sir. You, ma'am. Who else? I just prayed that prayer. I want to pray for you. It's a wonderful decision. Wonderful decision. Now, here's what I want to ask you to do. If you, would you look up here if you just prayed that prayer? You just ask Jesus to come in your heart. Would you just look up here? Here's what I want to encourage you to do. In a moment, the song's going to be sung. And when the invitation song is sang, I'm going to be down here. Some of our uh, pastoral team members and uh, are, are here as well. We have Bibles here on the side, just like this one. We'd like to give one to you today. Now, listen, don't be ashamed. Jesus said, whoever's ashamed of me, the Son of Man will be ashamed when he comes with his glory and his angels. So don't be ashamed today. Here's what I want to encourage you to do. In a minute, if you just raise your hand, you, you prayed that prayer. Or even if you didn't and you'd like somebody to pray with you, can I encourage you to do this? Just step right out, come out to the aisle, and just come forward. We'll take two to three minutes up here with you. We want to give you a Bible and just have a quick word of prayer. So you remember that decision that you made today. This, you say, well, I'm just, I'm a private person. Listen, we're not going to embarrass you today. We just want to rejoice in that wonderful decision that you made. So as this song is sung right now, you just step right out. Come right forward. We're waiting for you. We'd love to pray with you. See, on the hill of Calvary, my Savior bled for me. My Jesus set me free.
you come if the Lord's leading you. Did you mean it? I want to encourage you right now. Step on out. Just come forward. We'd love to have prayer with you. Ladies can pray with ladies. Men can pray with men. You just come right out. Just keep singing, Micah. Sing for the freedom he has won. Even death is dead and done. His life has overcome. This is what Jesus did. His life has overcome. Say the name of God. right where you are and close your eyes and uh, in this moment of reflection if you're here today and you say you know pastor I, I needed to make that decision I didn't do it there's still time you can call on the name of the Lord now if you're here and you'd say you know I, I needed to step out I want to remember that there's still time you can step out don't be ashamed Jesus wasn't ashamed for you he died naked on a cross and died a horrible death to save you pay for your sins We'd love to help you today just to make that simple decision. It's the most important decision a man can ever make, a woman could ever make, a boy or girl. And so this is your opportunity. Now, Father, I thank you for what you did, sending your son. Thank you, Jesus, for dying on the cross. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for coming in our hearts. Thank you, Lord, for your salvation and how simple it is. And I pray this morning. I thank you, Lord, for these few who today confess with their mouth put their faith and trust in you help them never be ashamed help them to remember this decision I do ask God this morning that you would help them to continue to grow and to be the Christians that you want them to be and Lord I praise you Lord for the fact that we can on Easter remember what you've done in Jesus holy precious name we pray and all God's people said Amen. Isn't that great? Hey, give a round of applause to those who trusted Jesus today. Isn't that great? I'm going to encourage you to be seated this morning, and uh, we have about a three-minute video about what's coming up next year at Greater Rhode Island. If you're here with us and visiting, again, thank you for being with us. I'll be in the lobby. If we can help you there, let us know. God bless you. With us today at Greater Rhode Island Baptist, we are so thankful to celebrate Easter with you. If you're watching us online, thank you for watching with us. For our guests today, please take a moment to visit gribt.com connect and fill out the connection card if you haven't done so during the service so that we can connect with and serve you. Here's a reminder of our ongoing opportunities here at church. Just a reminder that tonight only, we will not have our normally scheduled growth groups. Enjoy the evening with your family. This Wednesday evening at 7 p.m., we want to invite you back for our midweek prayer service. Pastor Carlos will be continuing his series, Foundational Truths, and then we will spend some time in prayer together. Youth Choir and Discipleship will meet downstairs at 7 p.m. Next Sunday morning, we'll meet right here at our regularly scheduled service time at 11 a.m. You are welcome to join us, and we would love the opportunity to serve you on a weekly basis. And at 6 p.m. next Sunday, we will continue our normally scheduled Sunday evening activities. We have growth groups for adults of all ages where we study the Bible together in a small group setting. Those meet right here in the auditorium. At 6 p.m., we also have Greater Rhode Island Student Ministries for all teens from 7th through 12th grade who meet downstairs for an evening of Bible study and fellowship. Our WANA program for kids 6th grade and under meet at 6 p.m. on Sundays as well. This is a fantastic children's hour where our kids are taught Bible lessons and participate in game time and fun activities for everyone. If you would like more information, you can visit our website at gribt.com to see a complete list of our Sunday evening activities. Remember that these are canceled tonight for Easter Sunday, but will resume next Sunday evening at 6 p.m. 
Here's what's coming up next at Greater Rhode Island Baptist. Two weeks from today, on April 14th, we will host our starting point lunch here at church. This is a complimentary lunch for anyone interested in learning more about the church or church membership. Pastor Navarrete will host this lunch immediately after the Sunday morning service. If you would like to attend, we ask that you please register online at gribt.com slash starting point or on the Church Center app. We look forward to getting to know you better. I want to invite you to stop by our Resource Center before you leave today. As you walk out of the auditorium, there is a wall on the right side of the lobby with many Christian resources aimed at helping you grow in your walk with Christ. There are Bibles, children's resources, and books for men and women on many different subjects. You can pay for any of these resources at the welcome tables in the lobby. We hope that you find something to encourage you in the days ahead. Guests, thank you again for joining us on this Easter Sunday. What a joy to celebrate a risen Savior. On your way out, be sure to stop by our Next Steps table in the back of the auditorium if you have any questions or would like more information about the message that you heard about today. Our team members are waiting there with several free resources just for you. For our first time guests, remember to swing by the welcome tent outside for a free gift bag from us as our gift to you for filling out a connection card. May God bless you this week as you live for him. 